is the Relentless Pursuit of Winning podcast. My name is Rick Meekins. I'm the managing partner at Epiphany Business Consulting and your host for today. I am so delighted to have you in the studio. Thank you for being here. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell so you can be notified every time we drop a new episode. Now let's get it started. Hey folks, this is the Relentless Pursuit of Winning podcast. My name is Rick Meekins. I am going to be your host today. And in the studio, we've got Steve Kopchaw. Steve, how are you, sir? I am doing well. I'm doing well. How are you today, man? I'm doing great. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Guys, this is going to be a great show. Um, I love talking about operations. I love talking about strategy. I love talking about leadership. I think you guys are going to love this too. So Steve is your guru, guys. So let's make sure we make this an awesome show for our audience. How's that? How's that sound, sir? Uh, sounds good to me, but I'm not a guru. I'm just a guy who's messed up a lot and I'm trying to help people not mess up a lot. So I... I don't want to, you know, I, I guess it's uh, one of my one of my pet peeves, if you will, the guru thing. Uh, so. <laughs> tell, tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. My, my thinking is that you learn a lot, you know, whether it's through books, but then the experience going along with that and the mess ups and the. You know, maybe my own perception here, but I feel as though a lot of people out there in social media, the Internet today. Yeah. Just show all of the wins and the positives. And the gurus never really share truly like it is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, I got to a place of winning because of a lot of failures. Right. Uh, you know, lots of reading of books and my mentors and a lot of people along the way to certainly help. But they were there certainly to help pick me up through this stuff. And a lot of my story really comes from the failures. Yeah. I feel as though a lot of times we see and we learn from these people who we're not able to truly create an authentic relationship with because we're just, we're all over the place. You're, you're down yeah. near Atlanta, up in Jersey, and we're hanging out and having fun because of all the computer tech today, which is great. But it leaves for some opportunity where, hey, you're going to listen to me talk today. We don't have a ton of time. You're not going to hear my entire life story. I'm going to have to talk about some of the highlights, but I need to give you some of the lowlights as well. So you know where it came from and why it's yeah. valuable. And I don't think we get that a lot from all the people online, all the editing that happens, all the perfect angles for the perfect lighting. Um, yeah. Everybody that made it has a story and messed up somewhere and did almost didn't make it. And without that context, I just think that it, it, I don't know, makes it a little bit, uh, unfair and unrelatable you know that's 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 true i i would never i would never um you know Im imply that you know there there hasn't been struggles or there haven't been difficulties or you know sometimes looking at these people online with their uh you know 10x your business and saying yeah okay <laughs> um i was reading um i was reading something uh i think we were yesterday i was i was reading something and they were talking about sometimes the difference between successful businesses and unsuccessful business really has a lot to do with luck i mean obviously you know there's a certain skill that we have there's experience etc cetera, etc cetera, but a lot of times it's you know being in the right place in the right time or being the right person or whatever it is that enables companies to you know, it separates those companies that are successful from unsuccessful. What, what, are, you, what are your thoughts on that? I 100% agree. And I think luck is a big piece of it. And, and this, listen, if you're super successful and you are the lucky one or something like that, that isn't to say that you didn't work hard, you didn't have a great idea, you didn't solve a valuable problem, and yeah. all those pieces. So I don't, I'm going to start off with that piece because I've, I've actually had this conversation loosely before around people who are very prevalent in my world. And I feel like they don't talk about some of their luck a little bit uh, or enough. Again, I know they worked hard. So if you're that person, I know you worked hard. I'm not taking that away from you, but timing, luck, the market, all of those things do play a role. Mm -hmm. Now you did come up with a good idea at the right time. You did take the right actions at the right time so there are things that have to happen but i also don't believe we can go out today and say hey this thing worked really really well 10 years ago and it's going to work well again today life has gone on life has moved technology 
has changed. People have changed. The, yeah. the interactions that we have has changed. We have AI. We didn't have AI. There's so much that's different. Yeah. But you do need to be lucky to an extent for your hard work, for your vision, for the mission, for all those things to be able to truly fit in. And listen, 1% luck might be all you need. You know, some people get 99% luck and that's amazing for them. Um, yeah. You don't always need a lot of it, but I do believe you need some of it. Awesome. 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 Um, for, for context, uh, you know, for our audience, why don't you give us a little bit of your background, where you come from? Yeah, I grew up uh, poor, really poor, double wide trailer, uh, food stamps poor. Um, mother was a drug addict, alcoholic, all those things. And, um, you know, I think I had a choice to really make of what direction do I want to go in life. And with some of the things that happened to me younger, I knew I wanted more for myself. And I, I started my professional career with one thing in mind, and it was to never be poor. I the, the thought process and I have vivid memories of being a kid and um, I was seven years old getting to take care of my sister who was uh, newborn at the time or weeks and months old mm -hmm. and I remember going mm -hmm. to the store and food stamps at the time were literally like a booklet pieces of paper of you know money so to speak to buy food mm -hmm. and I'm a seven or eight year old that just wants to buy something I want to buy for once like I'm tired of buying food all the time well I couldn't buy the thing that I wanted. It was some type of toy. I don't remember specifics, but, uh, the woman at the cash register, you could tell she felt bad telling me no. And I was like super upset that I couldn't have the thing, but it was just the fact of like, I couldn't have it. And I always remember, I never wanted to go to the store and not be able to buy what I wanted to buy. Yeah. Sometimes that comes in the form of a brand name that I like versus a generic name. Sometimes it comes in the form of, I want a really delicious steak versus no steak at all, or however it showed up, but I, I just never wanted to be poor. So, um, always had good work ethic in high school. I had three jobs at one time, literally 40, 40 hours a week doing electrical work, started my own business, doing landscaping work on the weekends with a buddy. And then on Friday nights I would go deliver pizzas. And uh, I was making in high school, literally like forty, fifty thousand dollars a year type money, which for a high school kid is you're rich, you're completely rich. Um, went to college, didn't love college, left after two years. It just wasn't my jam. I'm way more of a problem based learner. Let me stumble upon something I need to solve and I'll figure it out and I'll learn from yeah. there left college to go be a paid firefighter. In the meantime, I needed a job, started working at a gym because I got a free gym membership, gym membership and got paid. I needed the gym membership because I needed to get better, more physically fit for the state fire exam. And I found fitness and uh, personal training and I fell in love. And I was able to, at the time in 2006, make like 18, 24 bucks an hour, which was really good money for again, a no college, you know, didn't finish college, 20, 21 year old kid making really good money. Yeah. Um, and that passion grew there. So that started in around 2007, um, late 2007. And then I opened my first business in 2009. And uh, all the way up until I started selling my businesses off in 2017, at 17 locations along the way. Um, you know, so grew from being poor to jumping in and working and growing and plenty of trials and tribulations along the way of growing to those 17 locations. But, uh, at my peak, I owned 17 and then found consulting, started selling those businesses off. And now here we are today, about seven, eight years later, where I get to go and consult and help people grow and find their freedom and, and find what motivates them to go achieve something in their career and their entrepreneurial world. Yeah. Awesome. 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 Uh, how, how did you get to, how do you, how do you go from, you know, from, from one to 17? I mean, I, I know that there's, you know, all kinds of changes and challenges you probably had to, had to grow through in order to do that. There was three big moments that I would say through those eight years that I had to really level up my game. And the first one, so I opened my first business in 2009 and things were just easy it was good, was making good money, loved it. Like it, 
was easy. There was nothing hard about it. In 2009, when the economy wasn't great, people were paying really good money for personal training. Um, now I do live in Northern Bergen County, or the business was in Northern Bergen County, New Jersey. Easy area, people that did have wealth. But um, bought my second studio, which was an existing studio. And I remember having a conversation with my insurance guy. And your business insurance is kind of predicated based upon how much money you think you're you're going to do in top line revenue and whatever. And we had a conversation and I remember going, man, this year we'll do over a million dollars. Like I have a two room studio, those $200,000 plus per room. And now I just bought a three room studio. So I have five rooms total. So five rooms times $200,000 a piece, easy million dollars. And just things couldn't be brighter. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have been more wrong. Because all of a sudden, it was a massive slap in the face that I was the system in the first business. And because of that, that's why everything works so well. Yeah. Well, I also worked from 5.15 in the morning until 10.15 at night in my one business. The second one was 40 minutes, a river, and a, and a, uh, a bridge away and in a completely separate state. And... Th- the game completely changed. It can't be in two places at once. And I went from doing over $400,000 a year to doing $400,000 a year in two businesses. So it was a massive kick in the gut that I had to figure out. And it's just this big learning lesson that I was the system. I hadn't operationalized any part of my business. I was doing nothing to help move things along other than where I was at the time and trying to get the thing to happen. Mm -hmm. And that was really big learning step. Number one of I needed to find a way to systematize, operationalize, productize the business. So it could run without me doing all the things. And, um, that, that took a good 18 months to really solve. Yeah. But on the other side of that, things were better. Those two businesses were producing that million dollars top line per month. I was able to buy business three by business four, but something started to happen where business four happened and I was just unhappy. And in around 2014, so I was in business for about five years at the time. I had four locations. Mm -hmm. I just didn't enjoy it. I didn't love my businesses anymore. I had to work basically every single day. I'd only really taken one true real vacation in that five year time. And yet again, I wasn't really making any more money when I had number three, had number four. And my mentor at the time is like, hey, why? Why aren't these things working? Why are you unhappy? Two big things came out of that. The first was my response was, well, the marketing doesn't work. The leads suck. People aren't buying. The employees don't listen. And I kept pointing the finger every single step of the way. And he said something to me that, broke my heart in the moment, but he was like, what if you're the problem? And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, how am I the problem? It's all these things. And then some, like, I can't make my employees. I can't make the leads I can't make. And I had all these in the moment reasons as to why things weren't working. The other thing that I started to realize was I kept on getting more businesses because in my mind, more businesses was the key to not being poor. Yeah. The reality was more businesses was just a distraction at the time. It's really easy to say, Hey, I never want to come to this point and you can spend energy all day long doing that. Eight hours, eight hours, eight hours, eight hours, never touching that point. I'm never going to get poor, but I'm never going to do anything more. And I really, he asked the second question was like, what is it that you want? Like what, what are these businesses doing? What's the intention behind it? It was like, well, I don't want to be poor. Well, cool. Do you want to be wealthy? Because being wealthy and not being poor are two vastly different things. And I had never thought about where I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. I just knew where I never wanted to be. So this was really kind of the beginning stages of what today I call the freedom framework and what all entrepreneurs, I believe are working towards, but it was also the first time I had asked myself, well, what if I was in control of this thing that I think I'm not in control of, what would I do? 
and it was all of a sudden this weird thing like oh well employees don't listen well maybe they don't listen because i suck what could i change to try to get them to listen and all of a sudden they started listening it was like wow if i'm a boss who cares about them more they care about their boss more like Mm -hmm. mind blown you know Mm -hmm. like i was that young immature 20 something year old that was i don't need to say thank you their paychecks Mm -hmm. their thank you (laughs) and i can't believe i've ever said that but today it's part of the story and it's like all right well the marketing isn't working what if what would i change to make the marketing work and then that changed and all of a sudden marketing started working so it was like okay i am in control as much as i want to be so let me take ownership and let me make the changes i want to make to create the outcomes i want to create okay step one step two where am i going what why do i want more businesses well i want more businesses because and okay well great how does that show up what does the numbers need to look like for it to make sense is more businesses the thing or is more profit the thing more opportunities to learn what 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 is all of that? And when I started to get those things aligned and ultimately at the end of the day, it was my fault and I now became a better leader, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden business started to grow. So like I mentioned in my first five years from 2009 to around 2014, I only had four businesses. Now from 2015 to when I started selling businesses off in 2017 and 18, I went from four to 17. And it was because I was the one that was in control. I was the one who had to make the changes and do the thing. And Mm -hmm. now all of a sudden my business has exploded and I basically 4X what I had in business. So I didn't 10X, I didn't hit the number and all the things on marketing, but I 4X and it didn't suck. Uh The last really big moment was in or around 2017, I think it was shortly after the election that year. And uh, direct response or digital and social media based marketing changed overnight. There was a company, Cambridge Analytica. There was a big scandal that happened about the data and like Facebook advertising, meta advertising, and the data you could get. I remember the companies I was paying to do marketing for all my businesses it was literally like, I only want to advertise the people making more than $300,000 a year. We used to have that data. Mm-hmm. Well, after that scandal happened, all that got wiped out because why does everybody need that? And I could see it both ways, but nonetheless, I got an email the day after from my marketing agency saying they were ceasing operations. They were going to prorate me any of the funds that I had prepaid for the month and good luck, literally. Wow. And this was working in all at the time, 16 locations. And I had to go out and figure out marketing because like what am i going to do i have yeah. no idea and i had 60 days to solve it otherwise i would start have to let employees go start to have to reduce other expenses and that was going to be problematic and i didn't want to do it because i now cared about my team loved the leadership that was there loved the camaraderie loved all the pieces. i had over 65 people that worked for me so learning marketing was the first step in converting me more into a business consultant. And throughout that, I learned marketing. I learned the principles of marketing. I got a two comma, two comma club award through click funnels from being able to now market and sell things online. And it was an amazing journey. It also led me to the CEO of elements massage challenging me to, I bet you can't open a massage studio better than we can. And I'm like, I'm from Jersey. I don't lose, dude. Like, I'm down. Let's go. <laughs> I'm going to beat you. Well, without all the details, but I basically did marketing completely different. We opened studios separate of each other by like 20 days. So we're pretty close, similar time of year, very different markets. But I was in east of Cleveland, Ohio, like not one of the most populated places. They were in downtown Denver, a city. And we were opening a volume based business Mm -hmm. like just those, just that information alone. They should have smashed me Mm -hmm. smashed. Well, at the end of 30 days after they were open for 30 days, they had collected and processed 63 credit cards, which historically from elements massage was actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. 
on our first day of business, the first day we opened, we processed 185 credit cards. And my only regret is I didn't get 189 because I didn't literally 3X what they were. It was the only thing that I was like, oh man, I could have 3X them, but I didn't. Well, we processed credit cards the day we opened versus waiting 30 days. We did mm-hmm. marketing completely different. We put a CRM mm-hmm. in place. We did a bunch of things differently there yeah. than they had done. And it worked. And I remember the two things I cared about most out of that was I got a custom engraved bottle of scotch. And he had nice. to stand me up in front of the stage in front of the entire franchise and say, Steve beat me. And that ego <laughs> petting was just so real. I loved it. Well, he did it. Shared the numbers, and I was on cloud nine because, man, I won. Yes. I'm from Jersey, and I don't lose. Yes, sir. Well, I get off the stage, and this woman comes over to me, and she's like, Steve, you changed my life. And I'm like, I don't even know how you, who you are. How did I change your life? She said, well, I'm now more confident than ever to put my entire family's livelihood on the line, risk our house and our life savings to open this thing because of what you did and what you changed. The numbers make sense now. And in that moment, it was like, it, is that like that hair stands up here on your arm feeling like you get goosebumps. You're like, wow. Yeah. The bottle of scotch didn't matter. The standing on stage and getting the ego petting didn't matter. But changing this entrepreneur's life mattered. And that was the, huh, that was that aha moment that I want to do this forever yeah, I'm good owning these businesses and don't get me wrong. The businesses were great and helping my friends and their business kind of grow or do some marketing was great. But that like, I didn't know you, I changed your life. And now all of a sudden you're going to go truly be an entrepreneur and un- unlock your freedom. That was cool. And I left there. I was like, I'm going to start selling my businesses off and go do consulting full time. And um, that's, awesome. that's, that's been the path uh, along the way. So that's, that's the zero to 17 story back to zero. So. <laughs> wow. 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 That's, that's awesome. That's, that's, that's certainly, uh, um, confirming what, what, what mistake, I mean, with, with your observations, I guess, in, in the marketplace, I mean, what, what are, what are the mistakes, you know, you're seeing a lot of entrepreneurs make, you know, you got, you know, you look at a company, it's like, okay, you've got a good product, you know, you've got a, you know, clearly defined market, et cetera, et cetera. You know, wh- what is that thing that's keeping a lot of companies from being able to take that next step? So we're in a world where communication is getting worse and worse. We don't, we don't get to communicate and get to be with people as often. And there's a lot of businesses popping up that are online businesses, more or less, we have less interaction with a consumer, we ourselves are generally not speaking as much. Mm -hmm. And our ability to communicate what we do, and how we solve people's problems with our thing is getting worse. Social media is the main form of free advertising that exists today. Yeah, there is paid advertising again, usually through social media. But right now, the biggest opportunity is for people to be able to better articulate what it is that you do. So to put that in the kind of actual tangible items. So we'll talk fitness coaching, something that Mm -hmm. I kind of, that's where I focus a lot of my time. A lot of coaches out there, Hey, I help people lose weight. All right. Phenomenal. There's like 60% of people that want to lose weight. But if everybody says I want to lose weight and 60% of people want to lose weight, you really don't stand out. And most people that want to lose weight, like, they don't want to get told that they need to lose weight because guess what? They already know. Yeah. They already know, right? Like, hey, Rick, you wear glasses. Like, yeah, I know, Steve. I already know I wear glasses. <laughs> They're like, yeah, I got it. Like, it, it's one of those things where we we don't articulate well. But if we went down this road of, hey, my ideal potential client wants to lose weight because it allows them to feel more confident in a bathing suit on their summer vacation when they go to the beach it's like all right the vehicle to them achieving what they want is still weight loss Mm -hmm. that doesn't change but the the emotional motivator that's going to get them to do the thing and understand what it is that you do 
is you being able to help them feel confident in that bathing suit for their summer vacation. So advertising might look something like, are you uncomfortable in your bathing suit? Do you want to be more confident in your bathing suit? Do you hate your summer vacation because stuff like that is going to connect to the person that has that specific micro problem. Mm -hmm. And now you have their attention where you can bring them through a belief shifting framework process that now makes sure that they're aware you are the singular person that has the singular opportunity for them to achieve the result that they desire, which is going to be losing weight. So they feel more confident and doing things like that today, because we think it's so easy, but we mess it up all the time. It's hard for us to communicate at the level we need to, and people just aren't hearing your message. So yeah. that, that's one of the biggest opportunities in the marketplace today. Okay. Okay. So you say, you say it's a big opportunity. So you say it from the perspective of people just aren't doing that. So we've got the, we've got the messaging part of that, but what about, you know, really the, the, the distribution or the amplification, you know, of that message, how, how are we getting that out? How are we missing, you know, and getting that out to the market? It really works across any medium of conversation, of social media, of email, on your website, um, your landing pages, whatever it might be. So it, it, it's something that when you learn to articulate from a marketing perspective what it is and how you do at a high level, mm -hmm. you can insert that to anywhere you go, right? Like, hey, Rick, I can help you grow your business. <clears throat> how many times have you heard that? Like, yeah. A lot of times I'm not anything special, but if I come at you, Hey Rick, I know most entrepreneurs start a business because they want to unlock what their version of freedom is. I actually have the freedom framework that helps make sure entrepreneurs are working on the most important thing so they can unlock their freedom and they can achieve the goals they've set for themselves. Mm -hmm. Can I help you with that? You are way more intrigued. Now I still have to help you grow your business to unlock your freedom. Mm -hmm. But I didn't talk anything about business growth, and I spoke to you about something that may resonate more. Same token, you may not resonate at all with that right now. Like, Steve, I've unlocked my freedom. I'm good. I don't have to do a darn thing for the rest of my life, and life never has to change. Like, cool, man. High five. You're awesome. Let's mm -hmm. rock and roll. Let's be friends. Like, there's also that component where it does push out people who maybe don't fit the thing you're trying to focus on and sell. Because now yeah. – we can improve our sales opportunities because the people showing up are people who actually want the thing that we have, yeah. you know, so it email storytelling, Instagram, TikTok, if you're doing your dances, whatever it might be, long form content, it, it can go anywhere. Like when you meet somebody, you have a conversation I mean, over, over a podcast, like Rick, you're way more interested in unlocking your freedom than growing your business. Even though we still got to grow your business to unlock your freedom. It's the same vehicle. We mm -hmm. just phrase it differently. So you can use it anywhere when you understand it and you know it. Yeah. Yeah. How, how, how important, like you, you've talked about the, the freedom framework, uh, you know, a, a number of times, how important is creating like a, a branded piece like that? Um, I would consider it very important. You know, and, and for me, freedom framework is so important to me that I've went and trademarked it and spent that time and money and energy to do it wow. where if you find that online and you're my potential ideal customer and we talk through the idea of unlocking your freedom, well, guess who the only person is that has that system? Me. That'd be you. Only person. So when we think about that, Again, let's go back to weight loss. Everybody has some version of, I want to lose weight. There's a million places to go to cut calories, get a macro calculator, do some weird special diet, whatever it is. But if I come to you and very specifically, hey, I have the, I don't know, Rick, let's pretend you love pizza. I have the, the, the five-step pizza diet. I'm the only one, it's trademarked, it's very special, and you actually have to eat pizza four times per week in order to achieve the results that you want. Man, if you love pizza, and I'm the only one with the pizza diet, you're down on getting that thing because. 
Now, yeah. it doesn't have to be super specific and literal like the pizza diet or freedom framework. Mm -hmm. But if we go through and I have the ABC, XYZ, insert thing process to solve right. your problem, right. I have the unique mechanism that nobody else has. Now, all of a sudden, I further tie down that potential consumer yeah. as to why I am the answer to whatever problem they've resonated with that I've spoken about. So I consider it very important. I don't think everybody has to go out and trademark their things. I don't think everybody has to spend that time. Mm -hmm. But you have to use words that are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And let's say your thing is super valuable. Copyright is implied as long as you can prove you used it before somebody else used it. Yeah. So if you put something out there that nobody's using, it is yours. You can take somebody to court if they steal that from you. As long as you can prove you used it first for yeah. the public, right? So mm -hmm. very important. You don't have to spend all that time and money, but make sure you understand what your system is what makes you unique and why you should stand out in a crowded environment. I like that. I like that. So, so say I've gone out and I've created, you know, the pizza diet. Um, how do I protect that? Or is it important to protect that? I mean, this is, you know, like you said, this is something that can only get through a single source. How, how do you make sure that, you know, somebody else doesn't just copy it? The fact of the matter is, in today's world, people are going to just copy something you do if they like it. Yeah. The question becomes, should you care if they do? Now, if I go out and copy an iPhone and say, this is Steve's phone and you should buy my phone, but it's the iPhone, mm -hmm. Apple's going to come after me because of how big that business is. Yeah. And they have the money and the lawyers on the team and all the things. Somebody goes after and says, oh, I have the freedom framework. I'd probably want to understand exactly what's going on. I'd probably reach out. Hey, here's my legal trademark. If you give me credit, I don't care that you're using it. On top of it, if you're just using it and talking about the freedom framework personally, I don't overly care. Mm -hmm. I share the freedom framework across the board. It is little, if you go to Metric Mentor Labs, it is the thing on my website. I literally mm -hmm. hand over my cornerstone framework to the world. Yeah. If you want to know the seven steps of the freedom framework, you can go get it completely for free and you can take it and you can talk about it. And I'm never going to know. But for me, I'm a big believer in the idea of karma. Karma is unbeaten in the world all day, every day, every year. Karma wins. I will share my things for free because the right people are going to come to me and say, Hey, I need more of you in my life. And my coaching, I'm typically going to be that growth business. I'm not charging $100 a month for coaching. I'm more expensive than that. And I don't want 400 people. I want an amazing group of 10 to 20 people that I can coach at any one time. Nice. So when I get to meet people, you meet me. I believe I'm a very genuine person. I'm well articulated. I understand what I do very well. I'll also tell you what I don't do well. So don't ask me about those things. Um... And from that perspective, I'm kind of a, let me hand it out there for free. Again, if my freedom framework is generating me a ton of money or you use it, it's generating you a ton of money, I'm probably going to have a problem with it. But most people probably don't need to worry about that at this point in time. Yeah, yeah. That was actually going to be my next question. It's like, you know, I, I have conversations with folks about, you know, their secret sauce. You know, it's like, oh, can we put this out there? How much of... How much can we put that out there? I, I like your thinking. I, I think that that's, that's, that's brilliant. But I mean, is that something for everyone? Is that something that, you know, we as leaders kind of evolved to? Is that something that is, you know, kind of more of a personal choice? I mean, wh what are your thoughts? I think it's a personal choice, period. Really big butt. <laughs> if you're in my world, the people that I tend to gravitate towards are the ones who are bigger givers than takers interesting and in my mind the more i can give the more is going to come my way with ease because that's the type of person that i attract so i hand out frameworks that i've put together all day every day and let's also call a spade a spade for a moment like it's 2024 the amount of brand new things that have never been heard and have never been spoken about in a slightly different fashion ever, ever in this world are pretty minimal. 
So like my freedom framework is a culmination of seven steps that I've learned throughout reading books and experience and my mentors. Yeah. Now the freedom framework, the way it is, the processes behind it is very much something that is mine, but like, Hey, you should go educate yourself. Like I'm not the first person to tell you that. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the E's like, no, it's just not, it's not it. Like, Hey, we're going to maximize our business. And it's basically, should I hire somebody? Not the first person to invent that thing. Now mm -hmm. my profit per acquisition formula, I will tell you, I've never heard it before. No one's mm -hmm. ever told me before, and I've never heard it used anywhere else before. So I do think that that is something that I did invent and is a hundred percent mine and a different way to look at your KPIs in your business. So I'm a little more protective over that because it is very unique to me. Yeah. But still I hand it out to clients and here's how we're going to look at your business. And it's theirs to use forever. Even once they stop paying me, because I believe it's the key to unlocking communication and focus in your business as an entrepreneur. Yeah. And I want the world to have that because it's just, it's the way that we're going to grow. And it's the way that all of us, all humans on this earth are going to grow this thing in the direction that we want to, especially right. the business owners and business leaders that we have. But awesome. Awesome. I'm more of a, let me give you the things for free kind of guy. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. Um, so, um, do you want to jump into the freedom framework? Let's do it. Let's do it, man. We've got about 10 let's... minutes left. So, um, Let's, let's, I can get let's, through let's it. Make it happen. I got you. Awesome. <laughs> so, so freedom framework at its core starts off with the idea that we need to understand what our version of freedom is. Now your typical nine to fiver, we might hear the word retire and then entrepreneurs we're never retiring. We're always going to work and make money. Like that's the mantra and whatever mm -hmm. freedom is really the point in time you get to do what you want to do when you want to do it and how you want to do it. And no matter what, you don't have to show up to make money and your life can stay the same until the day you die. That is freedom. And if part of your freedom is being able to work, well, cool. Do you want to have to go to an office or have to have an office in your house? Or would you love to be able to do it from your private jet? Maybe you don't need a private jet. You just want to be able to do it from your second home down in Texas, whatever the thing might be. Yeah. You get to design your freedom. So we go through that process and what does freedom actually look like? Cause this is the thing we're working for and we need to be intentional about it. If your freedom requires $10 million, let's just say that, and you currently only have 1 million. All right, we're starting. We have $9 million to go in. How long do you want to get there? Well, I want to get there in 10 years. Awesome. So that means we got to do $900,000 a year. How much are you doing? 200,000. All right. Sounds like we're not going to hit our freedom. Can we agree that we need to make a change? Yes. Sweet. Now we have the plan in place or, Hey, we need to do 900,000 a year. How much you doing? I'm doing a million a year. Amazing. How do we reinforce this to make sure that it actually happens? Right. And the money is just arbitrary numbers. The money is a vehicle to unlock your freedom. Mm -hmm. It's not about the money. And if the only thing you love is money, we're not, we're just not going to work because that's not okay. my job. Right. So that's our first big thing that we have to establish. And everybody has a hard time with that because naming a number potentially that size is a challenge for a majority of us in this age range, because we were all taught that money is evil. Rich people suck and all the things. Yeah. Well, rich people suck. Wealthy people are awesome and wealthy people haven't changed who they are. They're still good people. And you can be wealthy at whatever number makes sense for you to be wealthy at. That's the cool thing. The seven steps. So first step, the F is filter. Filter is effectively figuring out what it is we need to work on. So that mm -hmm. way we know we're focusing on the right thing. I mentioned my profit per acquisition formula. That formula really quickly is your lifetime value of a client minus the cost to fulfill on your promise to that client minus the cost to acquire the consumer themselves, right? So value minus fulfillment minus acquisition equals profit. Every time you acquire somebody, you generate this much profit in your business. If we knew that one number, I knew how much money you needed to make per year. I can now tell you how many things you need to sell clients you need to serve or whatever the thing might be yeah. simple and easy. We're making this a math problem. So we know what we're doing. Step number two is relate. 
Once we know what we're working on, we're going to relate it to a person or a system, even if it's yourself. Sounds a little childish, but it is powerful to sit there and go, I have to fix this problem. You're giving yourself permission, but also going to keep yourself accountable. Mm. Step number three is educate. You have to educate yourself about the potential ways, the potential outcomes, the potential systems or people or whatever it is to help solve the problem. Are you going to solve it? Is somebody else going to solve it? What does that all look like? And without the education process, it becomes a little bit difficult to truly know what way you want to go. There might be a way to 10x something, but that might cost you five times more money and 10 times more time. So just 9x it because then you're saving all that time and money. And that's not a bad thing because your ROI is better off. Mm. And that's kind of the education process. Hmm. Next is we want to empower. If we're leading a team, leaders are the worst. They do not empower their team to take the thing across the finish line. If you don't have a team, empower yourself to ultimately to do it, but also to fail. Because sometimes we're not going to win. And because of that, we don't take the action we have to in our business. Step five, the D is define. Define what success looks like. Based upon the empowerment, the education, relating it to what's going to happen, define what success looks like. If I'm trying to get more leads and you currently have 10 leads per week, well, is 15 leads or 20 leads success based upon all the education you've done? Hmm. This isn't necessarily a you failed or you won, but rather when you get there, it allows you to debrief and ask important questions. It allows you to go back and look at what could I have done better so I can do it better yeah. next time and I don't fall into the same trap. O is optimize. Optimize is effectively asking ourselves the question of without adding an additional resource, not spending more time, not spending more money, is there any other way for me to optimize, increase the output of this thing that I just solved so that way I leave no stone unturned? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you can generate more profit without spending more money, why wouldn't you do that? Yeah. Step yeah. number seven, the M is maximize, basically the opposite. If I were to add more resources, spend more money, spend more time, can I squeeze more juice, increase the profit, maximize this thing? I.e. most business owners, oh, I have this thing, I'm going to hire somebody. Awesome. You're going to hire a person for $50,000 a year. How much revenue are they going to produce for that? 60000 That's a bad maximization <laughs> thing. Like, why are you going to spend fifty grand to only make ten? By the way, after taxes and fees and employee load and the headache and the leadership, it's not worth that. You're losing. Mm. So we know that like typically I'll suggest at least three, if not a four X, if you're going to spend 50, they should be able to produce 150 to 200. Yep. And it's not because you're being greedy. It's because there's opportunity costs while you're hiring them, training them, all those pieces. There's literally the profit you want to make. There's the support costs that go away, system fees, expenses, trainings, manuals, all of that stuff, the employee load, like no employee costs a dollar for dollar. It's usually 15 to 20% more. And then you leave profit. So if you're spending 50, hopefully you can make another 50 in profit and you're going to spend somewhere between 50 to hundred supporting that position. So those are really quickly your seven steps of the freedom framework, but effectively, what is your freedom? Why are you doing the thing? What's the problem you have to solve? Educate yourself about it and go take the appropriate actions to solve it. So that way you're actually moving in the right direction. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. I love that. Um, you have a parting thought for our guest, for our, <laughs> for our audience? Uh, my parting thought would be to slow down and actually think about what it is you want out of this life. We all loosely only get one. Right now yeah. you only get one. And we all can find ways to go get more of what we want. If you're not healthy, go find a way to get healthy. If you're not wealthy, go find a get more wealthy. If you don't have the relationships you want, go find those things because you only get one chance at it. And we need to be better as all humans at this. I don't care who you are, the whole political thing, the religious thing, all of those are excuses to not be better humans. And we can go be better humans and still serve the things that we care about ourselves without having to step on other people. And we can bring them along with us. I love that, man. I love that. I love that. If someone wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? 
Instagram and Facebook, uh, those two social media platforms are where I'm most active. Just search my name, Stephen with a P-H-E-N, Kopshaw with a K-O-P. Find me there, reach out, love chatting with people, love meeting new people. Man, thank you so much. This, is, this has been great. It's been enlightening for me. I'm sure the audience uh, has enjoyed it as well. I appreciate it. And we hope to uh, talk to you again sometime, all right? Thanks, Rick. I appreciate you having me on, man. How you got, man? This was cool, man. Thank you so much. Um, anything I can do for you?